Welcome to the Legatum Institute. We are an international think tank, an educational charity focused on promoting prosperity. And I'm Sian Hansen, the executive director here, and thank you so much for coming out this morning. It has been our privilege to work with Tim Montgomery for this past year. His project for the Legatum Institute was typically ambitious, a 40,000 word reflection on the nature and health of capitalism. It's a Herculean task, which he accomplished superbly. Tim believes that the free market offers the best hope for the advance of social justice, but he understands that reform is needed. His vision matches the Institute's vision. We know that capitalism is the best route to prosperity. And that is defined by our house as wealth and well-being. But we also admit that there's criticisms that have to be leveled against capitalism. And who better to discuss those arguments than the brilliant Tim Montgomery? Well, thank you very much, Sian, for that uh, introduction. And can I thank you, um, seeing this is my last uh, 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 moment on a Legatum stage for a little while, um, and all of the Legatum team, including Christina, for the, for the freedom that you have given me to think about this project. I've been able to think creatively about capitalism with no limits put upon me by you, and I hope you're pleased with the, with the outcome, but there's a, not many think tanks that would just bring someone in and just give them time away from a newspaper column to think about such a big subject as you've done, and I'm incredibly grateful um, uh, for that. Um, I'm going to speak uh, in a little while about uh, the report, but I'm incredibly grateful that the Chancellor, George Osborne, has agreed just to introduce um, this morning. Um, the report isn't about capitalism in a textbook, an ideal, abstract form of capitalism that only exists in the mind of a uh, libertarian think tank that um, conjures up an idea of capitalism as ideally they would like it to be. It's about capitalism as is practiced. And so to have someone who has spent the last five and a half years wrestling with the nature of the economic challenges post the crash be with us today is, is really appreciated. And I think it's what I admire about what uh, George has done as Chancellor is he's had this horrendous deficit. He's had to stabilize an economy that was facing extraordinary headwinds. But there has been the introduction of the living wage. There's been bank restructuring. There's been the apprenticeship levy to address a decades-long failure of British business to invest in vocational education. There's the flagship Northern Powerhouse um, project, including devolution, investment in infrastructure. There's the HS2 project. There's real vision here, not just to uh, deregulate, to cut, and to, to streamline, but to build as well, to change the framework in which capitalism operates. That's what the nature of the report is about as well, which I'll speak about after the Chancellor has spoken, but we're incredibly grateful, George, you found the time to be with us today to talk a, a few points about the report. Thank you. Well, Tim and Sian, it's fantastic to be here. One of the great things about being asked to uh, do an event like this is it actually forces you to read the pamphlet that you are um, speaking about, which I might not have had time to get round to, but thank God I did, because I think it's a brilliant piece uh, of work by Tim. Uh, and it expands, of course, on many of the themes that uh, Tim has written about for many years, both in the uh, pages of the Times newspaper and uh, on the Conservative Home uh, website. And what is interesting about uh, Tim's thinking is he, he identifies that challenge for uh, free marketeers, which is what are the underpinnings of a free market e economy. Uh, and he understands in a way that uh, quite often the opponents of uh, those who believe in the free market and capitalism don't really understand, which is that uh, people who support free markets and capitalism are not necessarily laissez-fairists. They're not people who believe that the market can just be left to itself. And that's uh, one of the uh, big arguments that Tim makes in this book. He identifies essentially two 
uh, great paradoxes of our age. Uh, the first paradox is this. We had in 2007, 2008, uh, a spectacular failure of capitalism. Uh, we had the biggest, deepest recession uh, in modern history. Indeed, on some uh, measures, it was actually deeper than the Great Recession in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and yet the response uh, in political systems around the world has actually not been to reject uh, capitalism. It tends to be the case that centre-right governments have uh, been elected, uh, not universally, but uh, it has tended to be the case, and that those who have uh, promised the overthrow of capitalism uh, have actually been rejected by electorates. And that is one of the paradoxes, is not how people anticipated uh, the uh, fallout of the Great uh, Recession might uh, turn out, uh, and is also not how the British public, or indeed the publics of the other countries that you've surveyed for this pamphlet, um, tend to express their views by quite substantial majorities. They think governments are better at uh, helping with the prosperity of people rather than free markets, and yet that's not how they've chosen to vote, and they've also been very skeptical, actually, of governments who have promised uh, a much bigger role for the state in recent years. That's one of the paradoxes. The second paradox which you identify is essentially one about free trade. Uh, so the, in my lifetime, the single biggest thing that has done more to make poverty history than anything else has been global free trade and the bringing of China and India into the free market system. Uh, that has lifted literally hundreds of millions of families uh, out of the grinding poverty that they and their families had lived in since time immemorial. Uh, and yet, uh, as you find in your report, uh, majorities in many of these countries that have benefited from this free trade and are immeasurably richer than they were uh, just uh, a couple of decades ago, majorities in countries like India and Indonesia and Brazil, uh, which you uh, have surveyed, uh, find that um, they are, uh, majorities d don't support free trade. They are for protectionism. They are skeptical of the benefits of free enterprise. Uh, and you also find that that skepticism exists in, in countries like our own. Now, those paradoxes might seem, uh, as I say, uh, new and unusual, but of course they've been with us for many centuries. Uh, and uh, although you begin your pamphlet uh, quoting Gordon Gecko, you do um, move swiftly on to Adam Smith, which is a sort of more fruitful place for you to uh, mine. Um, and it's often said about Adam Smith, uh, people often say, well, I, I prefer the theory of moral sentiments to the wealth of nations. Uh, and these are the two books he wrote. Uh, and of course, The Wealth of Nations is the one that's more famous. It's the one that's made it on, to, quite literally made it on to, into our currency uh, because it's on the um, 20 pound note. And, uh, and the theory, and, and The Wealth of Nations is the classic, uh, uh, yeah, classical explanation of um, free market theory and the invisible hand and how people's self interest, notably not their greed, as you point out, but their self interest. Uh, helps um, helps produce um, enrichment for for large numbers of people. Uh, the theory of moral sentiments, written earlier, is more about the ethical underpinning of society and how you uh, how how you um, base a society on values. But of course, they're not separate pieces of work in the sense that they were written by the same person. And uh, he first, uh, a couple of hundred years ago, was wrestling with the challenges uh, that Tim uh, and others are wrestling with. Uh, today. Uh, of course, uh, as, as he was kind enough to say in uh, the introduction, as we um, seek to make our country more competitive, as we seek to enable businesses, large and small, uh, to grow, we understand that uh, successful capitalism, successful free enterprise, can only happen within the framework <coughs> of the rule of law uh, of a society essentially built on trust. Uh, or within a uh, shared uh, framework of, of values in our country uh, and in a democratic uh, political system. Uh, and uh, he has identified things that we have sought to do, which might not be regarded as classically conservative, uh, in order to uh, ensure that framework of the free market is uh, alive and well. So we have taken action to restructure banks, to defer rewards in the financial system uh, to make sure that there's 
uh, less of an oligopoly amongst the big banks and things like the payment system is, is, is made available to new arrivals in the banking system. Uh, we have introduced, uh, although it's yet to come into effect, a national living wage. Uh, again, I remember when I was first in the Conservative Party, we were arguing against minimum wages. Uh, and actually, many of the predictions made at the time turned out not to be true about the minimum wage. Now I'm very proud that it's a Conservative government that is uh, introducing the living wage. Uh, we've accepted there's a big role for government, as Tim mentions, in trying to rebalance our economy geographically. Uh, that actually it's not enough just to say, uh, let the market do what it does uh, and see London become an ever more successful global city, great as that is, uh, but other parts of the country left behind. There is a role for government in trying to create a framework, not where government just simply hands money to other parts of the country, but creates a framework where businesses feel that they can come in and grow in other parts uh, of the country. Uh, and as he mentions, we are introducing an apprenticeship levy, which tackles a uh, historic problem in this country, which is our businesses, for whatever reasons, uh, and partly perhaps to do with the way they they are set up and have to report to shareholders and so on, do not always invest in the long-term skills of their workforce. Obviously, there are some fantastic exceptions to that rule, um, but uh, anyone who looks at the British economy comes to the conclusion that our poor skills and our failure to train the next generation are one of our uh, greatest weaknesses. So Tim, you've given us a lot of food for thought as you um, head off to the land of uh, free enterprise, uh, the United States, although of course um, they're not bad at crony capitalism either. Um, uh, so uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me along and therefore giving me a chance to read all your excellent work today. Uh, second, thanks for all the thought-provoking columns. I know you're going to go on writing some of them, but thanks for all the thought-provoking and, and unpredictable, in the best sense of the words, uh, columns that you have written over recent years. Uh, good luck at trying to decipher what on earth is going on in the US presidential election. And when you've worked it out, you can come back and tell us. Thank you. <laughs> When you thank me for all those columns, did you really mean all of the no, columns? Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did wonder when I was writing about tax credits in recent weeks whether you'd come, but you, you have, and thank you very much for, 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 for what you um, have said the, this morning. Um, the opinion polling that some of you may have seen that um, we published yesterday in the, in the Times was a real shock to me when we received the results. In Britain and America, you find that large majorities of people think that the free enterprise system has made not just the rich richer, which it has, but the poor poorer. Three quarters of people in most of the jurisdictions we surveyed uh, felt that big business was in some way unethical, that it had cheated its way to prosperity, polluted its way to prosperity, or bought its way to prosperity. And enormous pessimism as well. And the country of the seven nations that we did survey where pessimism was greatest was the United States, interestingly. The developed world is much more pessimistic than the developing world. So that's the backdrop. Seven years after the crash, as uh, the Chancellor has just said, we didn't get the big swing to the left that many predicted after the crash. But there is no room for complacency. The unhappiness about the capitalist system is still out there and we would be foolish just to assume that those of us who admire what the free enterprise system has accomplished that we can be complacent and just take that for granted. Now of course the people are wrong as I tried to say on the Today program yesterday the economic historian Deirdre McCloskey has noted the rich did become richer, true, but millions more have gas heating, cars, smallpox vaccinations, indoor plumbing, cheap travel, rights for women, lower child mortality, adequate nutrition, taller bodies, double life expectancy, schooling for their kids, newspapers, a vote, a shot at university, and respect. The world has been transformed by the free enterprise system. But the extraordinary thing is, you ask the electorates of Britain, you ask the electorates of America, is hunger rising, is poverty rising? And they will say yes, even when the absolute reverse 
is true. Capitalism, an industry, a idea which oversees a $600 billion global advertising budget every year, sells soap powder, sells cars, sells gadgets, cannot sell itself. And as George Osborne said, at the heart of capitalism is, or one of the interpretations of capitalism, is this idea of the invisible hand, Adam Smith's invisible hand. That we don't, that this progress that I've described isn't delivered by design, it's delivered kind of by accident. By the butcher, the brewer, the baker, the banker, the computer programmer, beautician, fashion designer, premiership footballer, Times columnist, um, providing for our needs, not from their benevolence, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Now, I don't think of self-interest as, as greed, but just to quote Maynard, John Maynard Keynes, how can a system that the nastiest motives of the nastiest men somehow or other work for the best results in, all, is in the best of all possible words? That nastiness, to use it to quote, consisting of, among other things, speculation, debt, and sometimes raw greed, how that translates into producing good things. Can a, a system based on that ever win the affection of people? And the answer that I give in the, um, this report is no. Something more is, is required. And probably the most important thing that I've read during a lot of reading over the last year I spent with the Legatum Institute um, was something I quoted in the Times on, on Monday by the founder and the chief executive of the Whole Foods supermarket chain. John Mackey warned that if the public comes to think that businesses are basically just a bunch of psychopaths running around trying to line their own pockets, then that system is going to be in trouble. If the public doesn't, in some sense, think that there is a fundamental goodness within business and that, that business cannot be trusted to do the right thing, then it's inevitably inviting large-scale and destructive regulation. If, in contrast, some way, business can exercise responsibilities to all its stakeholders, customers, employees, the wider community, the impulse to regulate and control can be lessened. Business, of course, will never be perfect. Business men, business women are sinners like the rest of us. But can it be, can it be better? Uh, you have to excuse me, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold. Um, and to quote Keynes again, I think part of the reform of capitalism has to begin with people who probably think of it as its greatest defenders. Keynes said, devotees of capitalism are often unduly conservative and reject reforms in its techniques which might really strengthen and preserve it for fear that they may prove to be the first steps away from capitalism itself. There are too many apologists within capitalism and within capitalist-friendly parties who will defend anything and everything that is done in the name of economic freedom. Massive corporate donations to political parties, boardroom pay that bears little relationship to underlying performance or international yardsticks, the idea that firms have no responsibilities to a domestic country's workforce, only a self-interested interest in large-scale immigration, that any kind of sky-high interest rate levied on a payday loan, as long as it's somehow the small print is buried away, that's okay. So perhaps we should go back to where maybe I should have started. What is capitalism? What is it we're trying to defend if it isn't this complete laissez-faire um, idea? And for a start, it is not how our enemies describe it. One of the books that I read um, over the summer was the book Post-Capitalism by the Channel 4 News economics editor Paul Mason. And he describes neoliberalism, the chattering class is now vogue term of abuse, as a belief that the state should be small except for its riot squad and secret police. <laughs> that the natural state of humankind is to be a bunch of ruthless individuals competing with each other. I challenged Dan Paul on Twitter to identify one single 
senior pro-capitalist politician in power in the world who fitted his ideological description. He's normally so active and engaging on Twitter, I did not get a reply. Because unlike uh, Paul Mason, capitalist defenders don't have their heads buried in the thinking of dead Marxist economists. Take the man who's just spoken to us um, here, who I suspect um, Paul Mason might regard as a, as a neoliberal. <laughs> He's half the uh, pace of the deficit reduction goals and introduced a living wage. He's cutting the police and the riot squad budgets so that he can expand the British health service. He's cutting welfare so that he can increase infrastructure spending. And another sign that business isn't always trusted by George Osborne or the Thatcherite Sajid Javid business secretary to always do the right thing, he's introduced that apprenticeship levy that he's already um, mentioned to compensate for British business lack of investment in vocational education. So capitalism is not uh, just out of a book, it's real and, uh, and we need to be thinking and talking about how it's practiced in real life, not how it looks like in a book. Capitalism is as Michael Novak, the Catholic theologian, has described it, a great blend of free markets, democratic and legal regulation and social and cultural values. Capitalism goes wrong when any one of those three spheres somehow goes wrong. And so the report that's going to be released over the next 10 days on the website in 10 installments isn't just a, a report about economics. It's as much about the nature of the state and it's much about the nature of the democratic and cultural sphere as well. Any one of those become unhealthy, then the whole system becomes unhealthy. When businesses become too powerful, they corrupt the political sphere. They avoid paying their fair share of tax. They construct restrictive practices. They prevent full and fair competition. When an unfocused or under-resourced government cannot provide basic social services or public infrastructure, the faith in the three market declines and particularly when family structures are weak, when children are poorly educated, when elderly citizens are neglected, and there is less voluntary redistribution, redistribution. When, in a sense, the moral cultural sphere is weak, redistribution is not happening in society so that the state becomes involved and tries to do that redistribution instead. And when the state does it, it does it much less well. So, as you see the report, it's not just a report about the free market, it's about all of these three spheres. And so I'll briefly just mention each of those three spheres and some of the key conclusions in each, in each, in each realm. Towards real free markets. One other opinion poll um, that we didn't conduct, but which certainly influenced um, my thinking, was in America people were asked, and I've spoken a lot about capitalism this morning, whether they liked the free market and whether they liked capitalism. The free market is much more popular than capitalism. So maybe we are using the wrong term. And actually, all if you look at the post-war economic think tanks that stood for economic liberalism, they did never use the word capitalism. Capitalism is actually a term invented by capitalism's critics, if you like. It was Milton Friedman in 1964 in his book Capitalism and Freedom when we started using this the right the liberals, the conservatives, everyone to describe it, started using this, this term. So perhaps that poll shouldn't just prompt a shift of language, it should prompt a deeper shift of thinking. Away from capitalism, the idea of large businesses, big bank balances, and politically well-connected tycoons, and towards a free market of competitive, dynamic, and consumer-orientated businesses. And to that end, the, poli the, paper, the, the policies that this paper proposes include ideas on patent reform, restriction of political donations, super majorities to authorise CEO pay, and trade deals to go to the heart of international symmetry. Why, when the left was in charge of G7 and G20 fora, was it always about aid budgets and climate change. And now that the right are back in charge, why aren't we doing and pushing more free trade agreements? I think there's much more scope for us to give global leadership on those fronts. And as the Chancellor said, nothing does more to tackle poverty than free trade. Towards a future-orientated state, if we designed a state from first principles, 
it would not look like the states that we have today. We have large welfare commitments, not to the poorest, but to the middle classes. Centralized systems of public sector pay and legacy forms of regulation that favor big business. We've created states to tackle yesteryear's problems, yesteryear's problems, and these solutions have been protected by public sector unions, entitled middle classes, and very powerful bureaucracies. As Britain is showing, the challenge must be to spend much more on infrastructure and R&D rather than welfare. The paper proposes a 21st century doomsday book to list and manage all the state assets that we have as commercial assets, an idea first proposed by Dag Detter, a Legatum Institute fellow. Higher capital ratios for larger banks to address the too big to fail problem. And also voting reforms to stop us becoming a gerontocracy. And, uh, and finally, um, towards more vibrant social institutions. I want to go back to the vision that one of the Chancellor's colleagues um, Oliver Letwin set out before the, the crash. Oliver Letwin noted how before Marx, politics was multidimensional, constitutional, social, environmental, as well as economic. That's certainly how Adam Smith wrote. He was not the number-crunching econometrician of today's economics profession. He was a moral philosopher. After Marx continued, Oliver Letwin. Socialists defended socialism and free marketeers defended capitalism. For both sides, the centerpiece of the debate was the system of economic management. Now, however, that the free market had triumphed from Beijing to Brussels, I'm not sure it has triumphed in Brussels, the mission of the modern Conservative Party is to bring about Britain's social revival, to improve the quality of life for everyone in our country, increasing our well-being, not just our wealth. In this new era, he said, irresponsible parents as well as irresponsible unions were just as much the cause of weakness. Britain, he said, was no longer just was no longer the sick man of Europe, but social breakdown could make it the continent's sick family of Europe, characterized by high levels of social atrophy. Social rather than economic decline was the new challenge. Oliver's speech given in 2007 was very badly timed just before the crash struck, but actually it was not fundamentally wrong. The weakness of social structures does need to move to the centre stage in politics again. Family breakdown in particular is a cause of unemployment, educational failure, personal happiness and growing demands on the public purse. The strength of family and community in southern European states explains why the economic hardship inflicted by the Eurozone and counterproductive employment legislation has not produced the social misery that, it might, that might have occurred in more atomised societies. The truth is, strong free market economies need to be underpinned by strong social networks. Pope Francis correctly described the family as the nearest hospital, the first school for the young, and the best home for the elderly. In debating what kind of statistics we collect, in deciding what economic policies we fashion, we must also focus on hitting social as well as economic goals. And to that end, the report includes a number of new measures of social growth, house building to help families and support business philanthropy. I'm going to start taking questions in a moment, but for the moment, that's enough for me. Thank you. The, the, the one final thing I would add before um, I start taking your questions is um, I, for revitalizing um, capitalism, revitalizing economics, isn't just for me an economic project um, either. I was in Hungary two weeks ago, and it hit me with more force than it's hit me before, is how much the whole Western model um, is in question. Um, the Hungarians looked at Britain and looked particularly at America, and they saw economic dysfunctionality. They saw political um, paralysis. Um, they saw a country that hadn't kept or been able to afford to keep its promises, such as the missile defense shield for Central and Eastern Europe. We know about Syria. We know about Iraq. There was this incredibly strong sense that the Western model, as well as the Western economic model, was in, was in retreat. And actually, revitalizing our economic competitiveness 
which has that two dimensions, revitalizing the vitality of it, but also the fairness of it, isn't just about our prosperity, it isn't just about social justice. I think it's about the extension of human rights and freedom around the world as well, because we are in a competition between uh, the capitalist model of the West and the capitalist model of the East. And for all sorts of reasons, other than just prosperity, I, I want our model to triumph.